Hello, everyone, and welcome to this webinar brought to you by the UCLA Nazarian Center for Israel Studies. I'm Dov Waxman, the director of the Nazarian Center and the Rosalind and Arthur Gilbert Foundation Chair of Israel Studies at UCLA. I'm delighted to introduce this webinar to you on the topic, which couldn't be more timely, of young American attitudes toward Israel. Over the past month, since the outbreak of the war between Israel and Hamas, a lot of attention has focused on the reverberations of the war on American college campuses and on how young Americans in particular are viewing the war. From the media coverage, you might get the impression that young Americans are staunchly pro-Palestinian and anti-Israel, and even that many of them actually support Hamas and condone its terrorism against Israeli civilians. But what does the empirical data actually indicate about the attitudes of young Americans toward Israel and toward the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? And what about the attitudes of young American Jews? How do they differ, if at all, from older generations? And if there is a generational divide, what explains it? How does the campus climate regarding Israel and Zionism influence the attitudes of young Americans, including young American Jews? And what impact does rising anti-Semitism have on the impact of attitudes on Israel and on American Jewish attitudes toward Israel? Our speakers today will try to answer these very topical questions and more. Before I introduce them, I'd just like to thank the co-organizers of this event, the Sadie and Ludwig Khan Chair of Jewish History at UCLA, the Kasdan Institute for the Study of the Jewish Role in American Life at the University of Southern California, and the Center for the Study of the United States at Tel Aviv University. This panel is the first of a three-part series of panels that, we all, that we've organized examining the attitudes of young people in the United States and in Israel. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers today. Aitan Hirsch is a professor of political science at Tufts University. His research focuses on US elections, voting rights, and civic participation. He is the author of Politics is for Power, published by Scribner in 2020, and Hacking the Electorate, published by Cambridge University Press in 2015. He's also authored many scholarly articles, including research examining the attitudes of young people toward Israel and on antisemitism. Matthew Boxer is an assistant research professor at the Cohen Center for Modern Jewish Studies and the Steinart Social Research Institute at Brandeis University, where he taught in the Hornstein Jewish Professional Leadership Program for 10 years. His research varies widely and includes the socio-demography and social psychology of the Jewish community, altruistic behaviors and preferences, Israel studies, formal and informal Jewish education, and antisemitism. He's a member of the National Advisory Board of the Center for Small Town Jewish Life at Colby College and a fellow of the Anti-Defamation League's Center for Antisemitism. Unfortunately, our third invited speaker, Professor Nazita Lajabadi, is unable to join us today. She just let us know. We're very sorry that she can't be with us. Okay, so let me now welcome our two uh, panelists and uh, put the, my first uh, questions to them. And I want to encourage everybody in the audience as I'm asking these questions to send us in your own questions, uh, and I will um, try to pose as many of them as I can to our speakers today. So uh, please send us your questions using the Q&A function in your screen. Okay, so first of all, uh, welcome. I'd like to ask you both initially, um, given the events of the past month and particularly uh, the protests and demonstrations that have been occurring on many college campuses, uh, could you just tell us a bit about what's been happening on your particular campuses at Brandeis and at Tufts over the past month, how students have been responding uh, to the events in Israel and the Gaza Strip, and, and whether there's been any anti-Semitic incidents on your campus? Um, maybe we'll start with you, Eitan. Sure. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here, and I'm um, looking forward to people's questions throughout and to your questions. Thank you for having me, Dove. Um, so our campus here at Tufts, we're in Boston at uh, uh, a uh, liberal arts environment with a, I, I would say, an overwhelmingly liberal leftist uh, orientation. Um, and so there's been a lot of activism um, from the Palestinian supporter side. Uh, it started right at the beginning where kids were uh, the students for justice in Palestine were celebrating the creative strategies, as they put it, used by Hamas. Um, 
we have kids chanting intifada intifada river to the sea um i think the students are are may, probably aware at this point that what those terms mean to the Jewish community, um, and they're they're quite persistent in using those same terms. Uh, the Students for Justice in Palestine group here on Tufts has, for a long time, uh, avoided any kind of dialogue. They they do not support talking to Jewish students, even uh, like the J Street group that wants to talk about um, peace. So they um, they're they're not interested as a student organization, as far as I can tell, in in any kind of of dialogue. They um, they support, you know, no Jewish state uh, at all uh, in 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 Israel, and uh, um, yeah, and we have staff who, uh, even from the very beginning of the Hamas attacks, uh, told me to directly that this is a, a form uh, that that calling Hamas terrorists would, was a racially coded language that would be inappropriate. Um, uh, and we have that. I think on the upside, we have I I. I uh, I teach politics. I teach a class on U.S. elections and a class on conservatism. I have about 120 students this semester. And the upside is I've never had more interesting and important and positive conversations in my office with students from all different backgrounds who um, wanted to learn and want to ask questions. And so this has been an opportunity for for learning and development for a lot of the students. And uh, um I think the students who are very engaged in, in the Jewish spaces feel a little bit beleaguered and uh, consistent with some of the evidence we'll talk about later, probably uh, a lot of students who are Jewish feel they're constantly asked to talk about their views on Israel. And for the vast majority of them, the, the, the true honest answer is they don't much know and haven't really thought about it that hard. Um, but the more engaged students feel that the sort of the burden of Jewish leadership on, on them. And then many other students you know, a, a full range of spectrum to not knowing anything, to, to feeling that, uh, to feeling some kind of, of burden or pressure. But for sure, the on the activist side, it's overwhelmingly um, not just uh, you know pro ceasefire or something like that, but um, really pro war on behalf of the uh, Palestinian liberation to the exclusion of of any Jewish state in Israel. Thank you. Uh, Matt, um, can you tell us a little bit about what's been happening at, at Brandeis? I know uh, they Brandeis was just recently became the first private university to uh, ban SJP on its campus altogether. I presume that was in the context of things that SJP has been doing on on the campus over the last month or so. Can you tell us a bit about what's been happening at Brandeis? Sure. So, uh, and again, thank you for uh, for inviting me. And uh, like Eitan, I uh, I look forward to the discussion and uh, and the questions. Uh, say Brandeis is a lot like Tufts. Uh, we're we're outside of Boston in Waltham. Uh, we're a research university with a strong tradition of liberal arts. Uh, about a third of our undergraduate population identify as Jewish. That uh, makes us fairly distinctive. Uh, but uh, pretty much everything Eitan said about tough supplies here too. Uh, I guess in some ways we're a microcosm of the world around us. Uh, there are lots of people on campus who are hurt and angry for different reasons. Uh, many for whom the current violence is little more than background noise that doesn't actually affect them personally. Uh, but this is a campus that is known for both its Jewish community and its commitment to social justice. And where most people know that you can be a Zionist and still also be livid over the occupation and Israeli policy toward Palestinians uh, and demand that Israel take every possible precaution to protect the lives of innocent Palestinians in Gaza, and that you could be an anti-Zionist and still recognize Jewish humanity and ties to the land and condemn violence. Uh, there are many people on campus who are taking either of these positions or both of these positions even in some cases. And there's a great deal of tension on campus even between them. But I feel like I need to say something has gone seriously off the rails since October 7th. Uh, and problems like these don't come from nowhere. Uh, Elon and Carol Troen are beloved here at Brandeis. Elon is an emeritus professor and he was the founding director of our Schusterman Center for Israel Studies. And he's trained a generation of scholars who understand that there are multiple narratives about Israel and Palestine. 
Ilan and Carol's daughter and son-in-law were murdered in their home in Kibbutz Holit, and their grandson was shot but survived. And of course, because the notion of six degrees of separation is more like two degrees in the Jewish community, uh, many of us in the Jewish community here at Brandeis have colleagues, friends, family who were murdered, tortured, kidnapped. Uh, many of us have friends and colleagues in Gaza and the West Bank as well, and we fear for their lives and their safety. And so in, in the context of all of this, it is absolutely horrifying to see that on our campus, which sits on unceded sacred land of the Massachusetts people, there is a loud group that unironically celebrates Hamas's indiscriminate acts of mass murder, torture, kidnapping, and brutality as resistance to occupation, uh, who are apparently incapable of expressing their justifiable opposition to Israeli policy toward Palestinians and their advocacy for an independent Palestinian state without glorifying this violence. Our Hillel director discouraged aggrieved Jewish students from counter-protesting an SJP gathering on campus. And for his trouble, uh, he received threats that local law enforcement deemed serious enough to assign him a security detail on the day of that gathering. But we also have students who feel that Brandeis has violated their free speech rights by defunding SJP and having seven of their protesters arrested on charges ranging from disturbing the peace to assault and battery on a police officer. All of this is depressing. Uh, but I don't want to leave things there because it doesn't tell the whole story. Our campus has also offered significant resources to assist students, faculty, and staff who are struggling with the current situation. We have many faculty and staff who have participated in events like this panel to help our community understand what is going on and to try to find ways to contribute to equitable and peaceful solutions. Our talented students, and they are very talented, uh, they know, especially after all the turmoil of the last several years, how to build community, even and perhaps especially in very difficult times. And I also want to mention uh, something that happened not on my campus, not at Brandeis, but I want to keep the details somewhat anonymized. Uh, I have a friend who's a professor of Jewish studies at another campus somewhere in the United States whose department initially agreed to co-sponsor an event that included a speaker from Jewish Voice for Peace, JVP. Uh, they did not decide to co-sponsor the event lightly. Uh, you know, even though uh, JVP representatives are persona non grata for much of the organized Jewish community, uh, their feeling was that it was important in times of hostility for students to hear from multiple diverse perspectives, even ones they might find uncomfortable or offensive or that they might imagine don't exist in the Jewish community. And to see that it was possible for people with such different viewpoints to have difficult conversations without ad hominem attacks, without threats, without violence, or other dehumanizing behavior. My friend was vilified by Jewish organizations, both on campus and in the community, and a large number of local rabbis who have never even bothered to speak with my friend publicly condemned them. My friend also received a number of threats that required police intervention. And at the event itself, someone in the audience made comments about Jews acting like Nazis, and it was the representative of JVP who told them to stop, that their remarks were inappropriate. I wanted to mention this incident because I think it highlights that even if you vehemently disagree with someone's views, they are not necessarily your enemy. And even if you agree with someone's views, they are not necessarily your friend. This zero-sum rhetoric and action are big contributors to the vitriol and violence of this conflict, both in Israel and Palestine and here at home and on our college campuses. And we are only making things worse when we amplify them. Uh, I've been particularly looking forward to this panel because uh, not so much my work, but I think the work that Eitan and I wish Nazita was here, uh, but the work that they've been doing suggests some ways forward. But we have to collectively have the courage and integrity to treat each other with dignity rather than hostility. And we just haven't been doing that over the last six weeks or so. Absolutely. Yeah, very true. 
Um, I want to ask both of you, um, you know, given what you've been talking about, what's been happening on your campus and some of the reactions of some students, um, to, th to kind of reflect on this in light of your own research. I mean, I, I as a scholar of this, have, have, you know, been forced to rethink a little bit some of my views about the uh, attitudes on the left toward Israel and, and the place of anti-Semitism on the left. Um, and I think, you know, any scholar in over the last six weeks or so really needs to, you know, working on, on any of these issues needs to kind of think about what October the 7th and its reverberations and the reaction to it mean for their own research. So I want to ask you both to kind of reflect on that and, 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 and whether, you know, what's uh, taken place has been a surprise for you, has caused you to uh, rethink some of your your own uh, views or whether in fact uh, your, your the prior work that you have done has really helped you to understand this moment. Uh, so Eitan, let me start with you. Sure, so of course, every piece of new information helps uh, uh, helps us reevaluate. Um, I'll speak to a couple pieces of, of data uh, that might be reflective. So uh, last year, year and a half ago, I released a study um, that was a survey of 2,000 Jewish college students and 1,000 non-Jewish college students across the country. Most of the study was not about um, Israel attitudes, but there were a few questions. And, you know, we saw, for example, that um, a lot of Jewish students feel that they pay a social cost on campus if they support uh, the, the right of Israel to exist as a Jewish state in any, in any form. Uh, actually, the majority of Jewish college students think that which is very surprising in the sense because the, the median Jewish college student in America is someone who grew up with very little Jewish education or, or, or connection to the Jewish community, typically go, grew up in, in a home with one Jewish parent um, rather than two. But the majority of students say, yeah, on my campus, you will pay a social penalty for supporting Israel Jewish state. And on campuses where there are Jewish populations, of course, there are some campuses that have you know almost no Jewish population. But uh, if you look at this, the non-Jewish students who are on the campuses with the Jewish population, you see that close to one in five say yes to the question, I wouldn't want to be friends with someone who supports uh, the right of Israel to exist Jewish state. Um, and so, 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 you know, we're, we're, we're going to continue to work on this. And I, I think so. Th there's a lot of underlying evidence, of, of course, from studies like this, and that was done at a really a low point of Israel-Palestine tensions that suggests you know, the, 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 um, there's a architecture there for that, that's being built on now. Um, I think the other big thing is that we need to do a lot more to understand exactly the, um, the demographic correlates of really strong uh, anti-Jewish and anti-Israel attitudes. So, in studies I had done previously in anti-Semitism, I had identified two, two really kind of epicenters for anti-Semitism among young American adults. Um, one is among the far right, uh, who are young, like kids, people under 30 who identify as alt-right, you have really high rates of just overt anti-Semitism, people who are willing to say Jews have too much power, they're, they're not loyal Americans. Um, but as high as rates of anti-Semitic views are on the far right, they are as high among young Black and Hispanic uh, uh, Americans. Uh, they answer those questions about Jewish power and Jewish disloyalty in almost exactly the same way as the white alt-right does. And I, and it's not an ideological uh, 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 relationship that is, if you're looking on the left, minorities more than white people on the left hold these views. And if you look on the right, about a third of Black and Hispanics, for instance, identify as conservative. They're much higher among Black and Hispanic conservatives than white conservatives. So it's a separate from an ideological uh, relationship. There is a racial relationship. And I think we're seeing that manifest on college campuses. And we're also seeing another demographic group that we haven't, um, I haven't studied much before, but um, uh, but is a also epicenter for extremely strong anti-Israel attitudes, which is the LGBT community on campuses. Uh, so for example, if you look at the data from my study um, last year, so for anyone who's interested, it's called, I think it's just called Jewish College Students in America. It's a study I wrote with the Jim Joseph Foundation. Um, we didn't look at this question of LGBT status, we, but we did in the, in the study, in the 
in the report. I didn't study it, but I looked at say folks who were agreeing with the statement. I don't think there should be a, uh, I can't remember exactly the wording, something like, I don't think there should be a Jewish state in what is Israel, Palestine. The, the, the question wording was meant to basically say, I don't think there should be any Jewish state. And, um, about a third of non-Jewish students who could answer the question yes or no agree with that statement. Uh, but agreement, I just looked, is about twice as high among LGBT uh, uh, college students as straight college students. And that's controlling for partisanship. So that is, LGBT students, for example, are disproportionately on the left. But even controlling for being on the left, you have just wildly high agreement with um, with with anti-Zionist views among that community. And so I think um, one thing, and of course it's delicate, we want to deal with it respectfully in every possible way, but we're seeing a non-ideological uh, or, or something that might be correlated with ideology, but it's separate from kind of left and right ideology when it comes to racial groups and when it comes to LGBTI status identification, where um, I think it's very important for those who care about these issues to understand like why do really strong anti-Jewish or anti-Israel attitudes emerge where they do? Uh, is it a media environment? Is it what, what's going on? And, um, and, and so, sorry, this is a really long-winded answer to your question, but I think these are, these are the kinds of things we're thinking about. And, and the, the last thing I'll say is that um, a lot of the work I've done is with experiments trying to understand where there are double standards. And I think that, um, uh, the student protests are giving us new ideas about what there are double standards for. So for example, uh, I we have masks, our students are often protesting on the left in masks. Um, and I think if a group of like white nationalists were taking over the campus center and saying, um, Jews will not replace us, uh, I don't think anyone would have a problem on our campus identifying that as white supremacy or anti-Semitism. I think if a masked group of students, again, in masks, were chanting, Zionists will not replace us, I think that both at, from the leadership down to the students would have um, a lot of ambiguity about whether that is anti-Semitic. And uh, that's the kind of experimental uh, scenario that um, I think we're learning we need to learn more about because uh, some of you know calling for globalizing the intifada uh strikes me as a a very uh as something that crosses my line of what's appropriate in a in a campus um and i don't know if that's where the students are in their belief about something like that or even where the university is in a belief about a, 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 I don't know and I and not just my university I'm talking about kind of across the board so I think there's a lot we need to do to explore that these kind of questions about where the line is and of course like the biggest one of the biggest uh I'm not a lawyer but one of the the most important um questions about free speech is that free speech and free speech restrictions must be applied in a content neutral way. And so if uh, a leftist is allowed to say essentially death to Jews, but a, uh, a, a rightist is not, then, um, uh, then one is not taking a, a content neutral approach. And, and we have to look at that with care. And then again, just to reiterate, and, and then and sort of like the identity groups and their relationships here are also something to explore. So, so I, before I, I, I turn to you, Matthew, I want to just ask uh, Aitan a, 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 a you know follow up question on that. Um, I mean, it, you 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 describe this the, you know the much higher opposition to Israel, anti Zionism, uh, and even anti Semitic attitudes among uh, racial ethnic minorities and among uh, the LGBTQ community with regards to Israel. I guess many people might look at that and say, is this really a reflection of, you know, this uh, vogue term intersectionality? Is that, is it somehow the consequence of maybe a concerted strategy on the part of Palestinian Americans and pro-Palestinian groups to engage in this kind of, um, you know, horizontal alliances with different groups on campus, right? And that's not just on campus, but in, in kind of progressive politics. How do you, how might we understand that? I mean, I know that historically, uh, when we're talking about the attitudes of African-Americans, 
that has been, that there's been historically, at least from the in 1970s, I think, higher levels of anti-Semitic attitudes. Um, so is that more of a kind of continuation of that historical pattern, or is it somehow a consequence of you know intersectionality and the ways in which groups um, that are seen as on the kind of you know oppressed side of this binary um, are kind of bonding together? Uh, it's a great question. I think you're right that the racial correlates of anti-Semitic attitudes are really long-standing. They apply in places where African Americans, for example, live in close proximity to Jews, as well as those in places where, where there are essentially no Jews. That is, if you look at most of the states in the United States where there are essentially no Jews, uh, uh, you still have very high, uh, noticeably higher rates of anti-Semitic views among African Americans. You definitely see both in the African American and Latino uh, and white communities a uh, higher rate of anti-Semitic attitudes among churchgoers, for example. But you also see, particularly among African Americans, higher rates of agreement with anti-Semitic statements among the college educated than the non-college educated. Um, so it's very hard to pin down. The, the LGBT correlate is new in the sense, like we didn't even study it in, and, and we collected the data and we had the data. We just didn't even think about studying it because it wasn't kind of on our, it, it just, it just wasn't high in the list of things to look at. So I, 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 just, I, I don't know, but now, now it strikes me as something we have to explore much more serious understanding. And I just have, I, I guess I have to know where my expertise is and where it's not. And it's not an answer in that question yet. I respect I respect your your dedication to sticking to the empirical data uh, and not engaging in in, in speculative uh, answers. Uh, Matt, um, you um, also conducted a lot of surveys of this, um, and in particular of, of uh, young American Jews. So um, I, again, I want to put the question to you. I put earlier to to Aitan. Um, has your has you, have you kind of had to rethink? any of your own uh, approaches or, or maybe even theoretical assumptions um, based upon what we've observed over the last six weeks or so? Yeah, so um, I, I I wrote my I, the, the question about, uh, you know, are there differences between uh, places where there are lots of Jews and places where there are no Jews is especially interesting to me. Uh, I wrote my doctoral dissertation on the impact of local Jewish community size on Jewish identity with a particular focus on very small Jewish communities. Uh, I grew up in Niagara Falls where there are fewer Jews than there are people watching this panel. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and that had a profound impact on my Jewish identity. What I've found in my research is that uh, uh, I, the analogy that I always use is Judaism is a contact sport in small communities. You have to get in the trenches, you have to get your hands dirty, you are personally responsible for any Jewish program, event, activity that you might want, because if you don't make it happen, it won't exist. Uh, and so perhaps the classic example of this is attending services. Uh, at the synagogue that I grew up in, in Niagara Falls, we had the same 10 people show up for Saturday morning services every week. It wasn't because they were religious. It was because they knew if I don't show up, there's no minion, there's no quorum necessary to hold services and read from the Torah. So I have to show up because the entire community is counting on me. Whereas here in the Boston area, if I don't show up to services on Saturday morning and uh, you know, in COVID times, I'm definitely not showing up in person. Uh, you know, it, it doesn't matter. Uh, you know, going to services is more like attending a concert. It's a spectator sport. I'm watching other people do Jewish things that may or may not be personally salient to me. Uh, but the fact that I'm watching other people do those things, uh, you know, that fundamentally changes the activity as opposed to doing them myself. And so how does anti-Semitism work in this context? Well, it depends. In a lot of small Jewish communities, 
uh, you know, people have perfectly wonderful relationships with the outside community. Uh, you know, they're, they're not worried about pogroms. They're not worried about significant incidents. Uh, when war breaks out in Israel and Palestine, uh, there might be some heated conversations. But for the most part, people get along. They're good neighbors. Uh, nothing happens. In other places, uh, it only takes one or two bad apples to ruin the entire experience of being a Jew in a small community. Uh, you know, that, that expression, there's uh, you know, only a couple of bad apples in the bunch. What they don't tell you is that a couple of bad apples in the barrel will ruin all of the other apples. Uh, it makes it impossible to have a high quality life when you don't know, is the person next to you a Nazi or are they safe? Uh, it becomes difficult to tell who is actively oppressing you and who is merely a bystander who doesn't want to get involved. And there are certain parallels to that, to the present situation. I think for both Jews and Muslims coming at this from both sides, you don't know who on the other side is actively trying to oppress you and who is just afraid to stand up for your dignity. Uh, now, all of that said, uh, most of my day-to-day -day work involves conducting large-scale, uh, well, and before I get into this, I should uh, I skip something there, I just realized. Uh, I should say that because of my background in one of these places where there were a lot of anti-Semites, and it was sometimes scary to go to school on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, I am sort of very cynical about anti-Semitism. I expect anti-Semitism everywhere I go. I expect to see it everywhere I go. And I have to work very hard not to instinctively, uh, what's the expression I want to use here? Hate people in general, uh, uh, you know, before I know them, before I know anything about them. Uh, it's not personal, it's just because they're people. Uh, but it's because I, I have that built into me now that I am worried about anti-Semitism. The first thing I do when I walk into any room is look for defensive barriers, defensive weapons, and offensive weapons. Uh, and of course, escape routes, because I've been in situations where anti-Semites have physically attacked me. And you don't forget it, you don't get over it. It never goes away. Uh, you know, when I have nightmares, when I have trouble sleeping, that's what I see in my head as uh, those particular incidents, even 30 years later. Uh, and so it's just, uh, you know, it, it's one of those things that I think, uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, I remember saying this to a friend of mine, uh, you know, welcome to my world. I hope you don't stay here too long. Uh, it's, it's a terrible place to be. Uh, but it's my day-to-day -day existence, and so it doesn't really affect my theoretical perspectives all that much. Uh, you know, I, I hope to be pleasantly surprised by a lack of, of bigotry everywhere I go. Uh, you, so most say, of my day... Yeah, sorry. sorry. Um, could you say something about what you think the impact of this... I mean, you talked in terms of the impact it's had upon you personally, this experience sure. of anti-Semitism. Um, I'm wondering whether... For many young American Jews today, and particularly over the past month, um, how this experience, and Eitan talked about, you know, many, well, one in five Jewish college students saying that they basically face a kind of litmus test for inclusion in certain, you know, uh, social circles or progressive groups. How do you think this um, is going to impact both their their, their own Jewish identities and especially their attachment to Israel. I mean, is there a connection in terms of uh, the experience of anti-Semitism, which is unfortunately becoming more common among young Jews and their attachment to Israel? And, you know, for decades, as yeah. you know, you know, there's been this conversation about young American Jews distancing from Israel and the declining attachment. Do you think rising anti-Semitism is likely or is already reversing that trend and leading to a renewed attachment to Israel? So uh, th this is extremely complicated. And to get into it, uh, I have to explain a little bit about uh, some of the misconceptions about the data regarding young Jewish adults' conceptions of Israel and their attitudes about Israel in the first place. Um, should also note, I've, uh, I think I've been in the minority on the distancing hypothesis. I have published about how it's, it's a little misleading. Uh, the reality is when you, uh, well, let me get into that. Um, 
So what I do with most of my time at the Cohen Center is I work on uh, large-scale representative sample surveys of Jewish communities around the United States. So we can tell uh, within a particular local area, are there differences in views on Israel or anything else uh, between older and younger Jews, between people who live in different neighborhoods, religious or not, synagogue members or not, uh, intermarried, unmarried, not married, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, and in these surveys, because they're used by local Jewish communities for planning purposes, uh, we don't always get to ask detailed questions about respondents' relationships to and perceptions of Israel. But when we do, the differences by age are often discrepant from what a lot of people expect. So, for example, in the recent study that we conducted for the Jewish community of Portland, Oregon, and southwestern Washington, which we just published in June, there were no statistically significant differences by age in the proportion of respondents who were somewhat or very attached to Israel or who explicitly identified as Zionists. And so, you know, for reference, uh, nationally, we get this from the Pew 2020 National Survey of the American Jewish Community, 58% uh, of American Jewish adults say they are somewhat or very attached to Israel. In the Portland area, it was 46%, so well below the national average. Uh, the, uh, you know, do you identify as a Zionist? That question was not asked on the Pew study, uh, but in Portland, 26% of Jewish adults, I think people expect that number to be higher pretty much everywhere, but in the Portland area, 26%, roughly one in four Jewish adults in the region explicitly identified as Zionists. Uh, I say explicitly because there's a, uh, you know, I prefer not to answer response that's given as well. 22% uh, selected that. And 52%, half, explicitly said, I am not a Zionist. Uh, now, those numbers might make you think that this is a community that is hostile to Israel. And there certainly are people, and again, these are Jews, this is not the general population. Uh, but this, uh, you know, there are certainly people in the community who are hostile to Israel, but the community as a whole is not. Uh, in, in this community, there's a direct correlation between age and feeling that Israel should be a refuge for Jewish people. That is, the older you are, the more likely you are to agree with this sentiment that Israel should be a refuge for Jewish people throughout the world. But even among the 18 to 34 demographic, which was you know, as young as we can go and still have enough cases for reliable statistical analysis, 68% agreed with this sentiment. Uh, and it's the same with the sense that Israel is under constant threat from hostile neighbors. Uh, agreement is lowest among respondents ages 18 to 34, but 64% of this group agree. And similarly, the 18 to 34 group is least likely to agree, to agree that it's important for Israel to be a Jewish state whatever that means. Uh, but 51%, half of this group agrees with that statement as well, compared with 65% of all Jewish adults in the region. And we also asked if respondents felt that Israel lives up to its values with respect to human rights. This is clearly about how they treat Palestinians. Uh, well, mostly, it might be about some other things too, uh, clearly is in the minds of some of our respondents but 58% of Jewish adults in the Portland area felt that Israel does not live up to its proclaimed values with respect to human rights, but the differences by age were not statistically significant. Uh, you know, similarly, if we look at Chicago's 2020 community study, there we did find significant differences by age on most of the Israel items, but again, that doesn't necessarily mean what people might think in terms of young adults' detachment or apathy. Uh, you know, where 66% of Jewish adults in Chicago felt somewhat or strongly connected uh, with older respondents tending to feel more connected to Israel, uh, we still saw that 52% of respondents in their, 20, uh, in their 20s felt somewhat or strongly attached to Israel. Uh, you know, where 40% of all Jewish adults in Chicago somewhat or strongly agreed that they would describe themselves as Zionists, it was 39%, so really no difference among those in their 20s. Uh, and where older adults were significantly more likely to say that caring about Israel was an essential part of being Jewish, we still had half of the respondents in their 20s who somewhat or strongly felt that way. So it's uh, interesting. So this idea of this 
generational divide is is uh, maybe overstated within the Jewish community um, when it comes to Israel, at least, and and maybe yeah. even narrowing in 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 recent weeks. Aitan, I want to kind of turn it over in terms of this question of generational divide. Um, in, do you see in in the surveys that you've conducted and the uh, a generational divide in terms of attitudes toward Israel and anti-Semitism. You mentioned how, you know, younger conservatives are particularly more likely to have anti-Semitic attitudes. Um, younger people are considered to be more likely to be kind of pro-Palestinian and anti-Israel. Do you see that that generational divide in your in your data? Um for sure. So the, the studies, some of the studies I'm talking about are, are really about anti-Semitism. They're connected a little bit to Israel, but um, well, I'll say it like this. So there's a huge divide between older and younger conservatives uh, about their attitudes towards Israel. Um, older conservatives love Israel like no one else in America loves Israel. They love Israel. Like we ask, you know, question like, do you like the culture and language and uh, uh, religions of these countries? And we ask about a bunch of countries. And older conservatives, I mean, have close to unanimous support <laughs> for Israel. It's really unbelievable num amount of of support. They are supportive politically, but also culturally. They're, they're, they, um, we ask because we ask separately in an experimental design about the politics and culture and. Um, just have very high commitments to Israel. The younger conservatives, conservatives under 30, do not have that same affinity. They have, in general, a greater affinity than the left has. But uh, the American young right is like kind of parav on Israel, as we would say. They are sort of in, indifferent. Um, part of this is a religious difference, that the older conservatives tend to be Protestant, evangelicals. That community has had longstanding ties to Israel. And the younger ultra conservatives tend to be Catholic. There's an increasingly growing number of folks who are in Eastern Orthodox traditions. And um, particularly the Catholic community is not, does not have the same affinity for Israel as the evangelical community has. And so um, uh, that's a big difference. On the, on the left, I mean, on the, uh, <laughs> um, uh, on the you know the the general left yeah I mean there's a there's an age divide but there's also a lot of uh, it's not it's not a huge age divide um, that a lot of older leftists also really do not like Israel um, and they are particularly put off by the 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 politics of Israel but they also are, are yeah they just don't have an affinity to the country uh, and so. You know, I would say like this, when we asked a bunch of countries that people have and the relationship to about, about eight different countries, the young left evaluates Israel like an enemy of the United States. They evaluate Israel just as they evaluate Iran or Russia, a country like that. Um, the older left and especially moderates and conservatives view Israel as more in the company of U.S. allies. Uh, like a, like a Mexico or an India. And um, it's hard, oh, it's, it's a bit hard to say that the attribution of that difference is related to politics when the left, particularly the young left, has extraordinarily favorable views to other countries that have serious human rights violations, that have serious discrimination against Muslim communities, that, you know, we asked about Nigeria, the left loves Nigeria, this country that bans homosexuality. That is a recipient of U.S. foreign aid. You know, so that's another thing that often comes up in conversations. Oh, but you, but Israel is a recipient of foreign aid. I, don't, I really don't think that that is the explanation. I don't even think necessarily the politics are the explanation. Um, uh, there is a salience around Israel that is different and an affinity that is different. I think that um, when people think about foreign countries, they don't... Uh, have to think about their politics. That is, if you are asked, what do you think of Mexico? You might have a right-leaning person saying, I don't like Mexico so much, and a left-leaning person saying, I do. And part of that difference might be a difference on the terms on which they are evaluating these countries, where the right-leaning person who is in a right media environment might think politics. They might think drug cartels and immigration. And when they say they don't like Mexico, that's what they mean. 
And the left, when they say, do you like Mexico? They are not thinking about politics at all. They're thinking about culture and food and all sorts of stuff. And they, yeah, of course they'd like Mexico. I think when Jews are asked about Israel, they essentially evaluate it like the left evaluates Mexico, which is like, yeah, I, I, I like Israel. I like the culture. It's my religion, the food, all, all that stuff. And it's not about politics. I think increasingly a lot of people who are not Jewish, when they think about Israel, they do think about politics. And so the reason they might say, I love Nigeria and I love India, but I don't like Israel, it's that they are evaluating these countries on entirely different terms. Uh, now, there's a question of why they are evaluating countries on terms. And again, that's where I'm going to shut up and say, I don't know, you tell me why they're evaluating on different terms. <laughs> I think that's, yeah, that's a very interesting uh, insight. I think that, yeah, particularly for young people, you know, who uh, who aren't Jewish, who look at Israel solely through the lens of the Israel-Palestine issue. That is the that is what shapes their attitude predominantly to Israel. Whereas young American Jews, who often, particularly those who have visited Israel, um, but even those who haven't, have a, have a, don't look at it just narrowly through that one lens. But it's, so it's interesting. I mean, I'm kind of trying to, build upon what both of you have observed, that there is a real uh, difference in young, non-Jewish American attitudes, that there is something going on there. It's different than their older counterparts on the left. It's specific and it's and it can veer into anti-Semitism. Um, whereas there is less of a difference between young American Jews and older men. There isn't as much of a generational growth. So when it comes to attitudes to Israel, Jews, whatever age group are more like other Jews in a sense and 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 further removed from uh, young American Jews from their counterparts uh from young Americans in in general I, I hopefully that is a kind of uh, a decent summary um and I, I, I wonder you know um when we're thinking about kind of what explains the these discrepancies right um and uh what so young American Jews are not uh, not nearly as distanced or alienated or disaffected from Israel as as you know some in the Jewish community like to worry or fret about or you know uh, uh, the discourse is kind of conveyed. But young American non-Jews are seemingly particularly um, and especially almost exceptionally are, are hostile to Israel in ways that they aren't toward other countries which. Um, you might expect them to be. Is to what do we attribute these differences? I mean, is it when it when we're talking about young Americans in general, not Jewish Americans here? You know, is it about their what that where they're getting their information, their news? Is it that they rely on on social media and Instagram? And you know, do we know is that's what's kind of forming their attitude? Is it um, you know the college courses that some that they may be taking? Where when is this coming? Especially because it's different than older uh, older uh, people on the left. So I want to put that question to you. I'm going to give you a moment to think about that, and I also want to ask more about when these hostility to Israel bleeds into anti-Semitism and how much we're seeing that kind of anti-Semitic anti-Zionism uh, emerge among young people. And Matt, I, I'm going to ask you, and I'm going to give you a moment to think about this. You know, when it comes to young American Jews, it seems then that their attitudes toward Israel are not simply are, dip, are distinct from non their non Jewish counterparts. Where are those attitudes coming from? I mean, is that really more of a a, a consequence of being embedded in Jewish communities? Is there a big difference between those who are uh, um, young Jews who have who are kind of affiliated, if you like, who have you know been um raised in 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 uh jewish households and with uh synagogue attendance etc um is that the is that the difference um where are their, those attitudes coming from so so what, i guess what i'm asking is about what's shaping these attitudes um in the here and now i'm going to later ask you about whether they're likely to persist but let's start maybe with you Eitan, talking a little bit about where you think these attitudes are coming from um, as far as you can tell. Okay, great. Yeah, I actually want to answer both parts of the question. Yeah, um, please do. Yeah, so I would say on the non-Jewish uh, side of just sort of the American public, the younger population is 
uh, has much higher rates of racial minorities, where we know that uh, both anti-Jewish and anti-Israel sentiment is stronger. So it makes sense as those communities, if they continue to maintain those views, that will be a growing. And 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 and, and by the way, I think that means enduring. Uh, trend in American politics. Uh, that is, we don't see a huge difference between yo younger and, and older, younger Blacks and Hispanics have slightly higher rates of anti-Semitism, but not much All across the board, it's higher. So, you know, we expect as um, uh, non-white populations to have a growing share of the public, I think we'll expect higher rates of of those attitudes to persist. I think the left on in America is also increasingly um, uh, non-religious and anti-religious in general. So they, they, you know, the relationship between Christianity and, and Judaism in Israel is complicated, but, um, uh, the, the sort of like the coalition of, of, of atheists and, and, uh, is very strong on the left. And, um, and you do have a lot of very negative attitudes towards, towards Israel in in that demographic and that too i don't think is going away as people i don't think people are going to age out of that one either so i think you have some persistent trends that are going to explain this on on, on the um when it bleeds into anti-semitism it uh I, I again i mean i i think that in our studies we're really clear if we ask a question like do, do you think jews have too much power we validate that like 90% of Jews think that it's anti-Semitic to say Jews have too much power. Um, I don't engage in like really parsing what the anti-Israel stuff that's anti-Semitic or not um, in the, my research, but at a personal level, I'll say like things like uh, globalize the Intifada seems like pretty clearly uh, a call for violence against civilians who hold zionist beliefs anywhere in the world that strikes me as as a, both a cult of violence and anti-semitic so i think there's definitely a line there i think students on our campuses are crossing that line on the on the jewish side um i i do think you see a couple of things that are that are probably known to most of the call uh, listeners here but i'll just emphasize them which is that um in non-Orthodox wings of Judaism, particularly in Reform Judaism, even institutional Reform Judaism, social justice is a very big part of one's Jewish identity. Uh, and, and so Jewish students come to college campuses expecting that at a Hillel, there will be politics because they care about, uh, they don't just care about social justice, they think of it as integrated, integral into their Jewish life. On the more observant side of the spectrum, which is increasingly Republican in orientation, Israel plays a different role. It's much more familial. It's much more like uh, one of several components to one's Jewish identity. Um, and social justice as a value is also one of, but but not a dominating part of one's social identity. And so um, on the, on the, and yet, even I think on the like the reform, uh, say orientation of Judaism, is has reacted much more similar to conservative and orthodox in the last month than people who are totally unaffiliated. The unaffiliated Jewish students um, in our study, we do a lot. We have a lot of questions in uh, the study of the two thousand Jewish college students about their background and their attitudes. But generally, the kids who grew up with less family engagement have a much lower affinity for their Jewish identity, much lower affinity for Israel. It's like, you know, if you want to predict based on someone's background characteristics, how they think about Israel, it's actually quite easy. Uh, the lower the background you have, and I don't mean to evaluate that for good or bad at a moral level, I'm just evaluating it descriptively, the less that your family uh, engaged in Jewish life, the more disconnected you are from your Jewish identity and the and the more likely you are to think uh, to not care about Israel existing or 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 to support it. So so and that's a growing, uh, uh, vastly growing part of the of the Jewish community. So I think that, you know, for that reason, you really see um, on some level a huge divergence between how more observant uh, Jewish students and then Jewish life 
think about their political coalition and think about their relationship to Israel than you would see on the on the disengaged side and on, and on the on the left. Sorry, there are a lot of different answers to your no, question. That's fascinating. So we're really, in a way, talking about two different groups of young American Jews in many ways. Uh, Matt, can you say something about, I mean, and maybe um, we are getting questions that are also asking about, specifically with regards to the attitude of young American Jews, you know, the role that birthright plays in shaping these attitudes, um, the question of whether having two Jewish parents uh, impacts, I mean, you know, when we, when we, when you dig into this, and I want to ask, not just because we, we hear a lot about attachment to Israel, but I think what you were talking about earlier about attitude towards Zionism. Um, is there, to what extent, if any, have you seen any sort of correlation between, say, you know, attitude as more uh, more likely to support Zionism um, among Jews who have two Jewish parents or attended summer camp or day schools um, or brat or, or birthright? Um, is that a is that a dividing line? Not just attachment to Israel, but actually attitudes towards Zionism. Yeah, I, I wouldn't describe it as a divide so much as a continuum. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, uh, uh, and there's a question I used to ask my students when I taught statistics uh, along with trends in contemporary Jewish life. It's an odd mix, but it works really nicely. Uh, you know, that if you, if you had to scale Jewish identity from zero to, to 100, which you should never actually do, uh, but if you did, how do you get you know, how do you get your points? You can get them from a lot of different sources. Uh, and in some respects, it doesn't matter where you get your points from. It just matters that you get your points. Uh, and so, you know, if you're getting your points from having two Jewish parents, well, as it turns out, that's not as important as having at least one Jewish parent, uh, even if your other parent isn't Jewish, who is committed to your Jewish identity and to providing you with Jewish content, knowledge, and experiences. Uh, you know, if you get your experience from, uh, you know, if you get your points from Jewish day school, uh, okay, that's pretty valuable. You learn a lot, but it might not be as valuable as living Jewish life. Um, you know, and uh, you know, and I talk about birthright. So uh, uh, the Cohen Center has been doing evaluation research for Birthright Israel for uh, over twenty years now. Uh, and among the things that we find, uh, you know, so birthright is very, very important for building the Jewish identity of its participants. And it's remarkable how much of an impact a 10 day program can have. And yes, it also affects their affinity for Israel. It makes them feel closer to Israel. It makes them more supportive of Israel in a lot of ways. It builds personal relationships with the land, the state, the people, the culture, all kinds of things, uh, but the impact of the program does not always comport with popular narratives about it. Uh, you know, critics like to say that birthright is a little more than Zionist and anti-Palestinian propaganda. But every time we've asked participants, both before they went on the trip and after they came back from it about their views, we find, for example, that the people who went, who participated in this program, who had this experience, tend to become more open to compromises between Israel and the Palestinians for the sake of peace. Uh, if that's propaganda and the goal is zero-sum maximalist support for any and all claims that Israel might make, it's the worst propaganda program in the history of the world. Uh, but that's not really what Birthright does. Birthright promotes Jewish identity. And so, you know, to, to add on to what Eitan was saying, and you might have seen me nodding like a bobblehead, I agree with everything he said. Uh, let me add a couple more items. When people say that birthright is just propaganda, it feels for a lot of Jews like an attack against any notion that Jews can have a connection to their, their heritage, their ethnicity, their religion, their people, the ties to our ancestral homeland. Uh, you know, I, I, I started my remarks, you know, in response to your first question, talking about Elon Trone and all of the scholars that he has trained to understand that there are multiple peoples with attachment to this land, and they have different narratives that are sometimes in competition with each other and sometimes overlap, but they're valid. 
uh, you know, to say that Jews have no claim to this land, that we have no tie to this land, that we have to go back to Europe where we came from, where, by the way, roughly half, even a little bit more of the Jews in Israel did not come from Europe. Uh, they came from the Middle East. Uh, but to say that you know you have to go back to Europe where we were killed for thousands of years because we were Jewish, uh, where our families, no, where my family certainly, where Eitan's family certainly, where we no longer are because we left Europe to come to America, which was safer, uh, you know, it just it makes no sense unless the argument is you hate Jews. Uh, and I don't think that's the way it's always intended, but it's the way it's experienced by an awful lot of Jews. Uh, and that's a huge problem. Um, I should also clarify here, it's not that there are no differences between young Jews and old Jews. There are differences. Uh, but again, some of this is just perception. Um, I was jotting down some notes this morning and I came across an op-ed I wrote a few years ago uh, I want to read to you something that uh, that I used in that op-ed. Uh, this is something written by a colleague of mine. Uh, and what he writes is, American Jewish Middle Agers are significantly more attached emotionally to Israel than are young adults. A higher percentage of young adults feels not attached and lower percentages feel either very or extremely attached to Israel. One might argue that most of the survey, uh, this is writing about a particular survey, was conducted when Likud was in power and that the young adults' lower levels of emotional attachment to Israel are the product of their disenchantment with Israel's forsaking the democratic socialist tradition of the labor party for what the older adults perceived as the assertive nationalism of Likud. This sounds like every piece of writing about differences between older and younger Jewish adults' views and attachment to Israel that we've seen in the last at least 30 years. Uh, and if it sounds familiar, uh, you know, if it sounds like this is something that might have been written about you know, young Jewish adults today versus older Jewish adults today, uh, I, I get that. But this was written in 1994 where the younger adults that were being described, this was written by my colleague Chaim Waxman in the Journal for the Scientific Study of Religion, writing about the findings from the 1990 National Jewish Population Survey. Oh, it's, it's been a long, uh, uh, long standing uh, claim. Uh, uh, yes. I want to I, I focus a bit more narrowly now on, on, the, on attitude towards Zionism. Um, Eitan, I mean, so I'm gonna ask, you know, to talk more about how young American Jews view Zionism and, and what role it plays in their Jewish identity. Uh, but but Eitan, I want to ask you, you know, in, when we talk about young progressives, right, you, as you said, not all young progressives are, there's, there's different views within that, uh, that broad group, uh, different attitudes toward uh, Zionism. First of all, um, you know, we often hear the claim that anti-Zionism on the left, and particularly among young people on the left, is anti-Semitic or, or at least is correlated with anti-Semitism. In other words, that there's a kind of statistical correlation between anti-Jewish attitudes and anti-Zionist attitudes. Does, can, does, do you see any of that? Or do you see at least, are there any groups within the left or among progressives who may be anti-Zionist, but that doesn't become anti-Semitic? In other words, we want to know not just about the overlap, but also when it doesn't overlap. Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, just I can cite some basic statistics from others, which is like there have been these studies done that, you know, ask a bunch of questions about Israel and a bunch of questions about Jews. And, you know, basically people hold very extreme anti-Israel views, very extreme ones like that Israel purposely targets civilians. Maybe that's not maybe that's commonly held now, but be, things like that. Uh, if you start agreeing with a lot of those and then you ask that person later on a bunch of stuff about Jews that's unrelated to Israel, you know, do Jews control finance? The scales are correlated. So it's a good predictor at the extreme level. But then, of course, a lot of people are not in the extreme. Some people just hold, um, you know, they're, they're anti the government of Israel or they, you know, or they, I, I think that the um, and and I, I hesitate to talk about this because I'm talking to someone who's 
more expert than me at it. But I, you know, my under my sense of the Jewish community, particularly as it engages in campus life here, is that um, there's a couple of different reasons why there seems to be spillover. So one is just the extreme views that the Zionists are doing these horrible things. They, you know, even right now, they're they're perp- the reason they're targeting at a hospital is because they want to target the weakest people. Not you know th- th- this sort of or they're conducting genocide. Yes, exactly. Yes, yeah, right. Yeah. Um, another view is just that there is like uh, um, that there is essentially just like a a lack of thought on the strong anti-Zionist side of what is to happen to the Jews under their plan of no Jewish state. Um, That someone says, I'm not an anti-Zionist, I'm I'm not an anti-Semite, I just want there to be uh, a a democratic state where that's that's somehow maybe similar to the United States Constitution that has protections of religious liberty. And the Jewish community overwhelmingly thinks that that is a state in which many, many Jews will be murdered. And so it's not anti-Semitic in intent, but it's anti-Semitic in effect. That's how it's interpreted. And, um, and a lot of that spillover seems to be at that boundary where, um, and of course, many of like at the student level, when they say something like intifada, a river to the sea, they just haven't thought it through. And if you ask them, if I were to ask them a basic question of what the intention is or what the expectation is, they like they haven't thought two steps ahead. Now, to their credit, when I also talk to them about the topics that I do am an expert on, like election policy or uh, uh, or something or something like that, they also haven't thought two steps ahead <laughs> about what the negative consequences are for policies of any kind that we have in generally in public policy. Something that's well intentioned that backfires in these ten ways and has you know uh, has all these unintended consequences. And so um, much of this is just a a move that begins with feelings and ends with feelings and doesn't account for for that. And 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 what that amounts to is then a story of of where your empathies lie, of who you are in community with. And unfortunately or fortunately, like a lot of politics, when you ask people's political views and how they're constrained by their own ideology, a lot of it doesn't make sense. Like why one party supports vote by mail and one doesn't. Is it really like in, inherent to their views? I mean, just to give on that example for a second, because I, I do study that a lot. Like. There are serious issues on both sides of male voting that we can all agree on. You know, there is a lack of privacy. So there's spousal intimidation and things like that. On the other hand, it makes voting easier. On the other hand, does it increase turnout? No. But do people like it? Yes. Is it good? You know, and but why is that an ideological fight? Well, basically because like the combination of COVID and Trump turned it into one. And so now if you ask a student, you know, what's right, they don't just think. I like male voting, for example, as a policy. They think if we don't have male voting, it's a threat to democracy. Or if we do have, and 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 like, it doesn't make any sense. Um, and I think a lot of Israel policy is like that too, where uh, they've gotten wrapped up in a combination of a social environment and a media environment and an ideological worldview, where you're starting to take positions similar to to Democrats and Republicans argue about male voting, where like. Um, it doesn't make sense, but the difference between male voting and this is like the consequences are are quite extreme. Right. Uh, yeah. um, uh, so, they, so there you go. <laughs> I, I, I want to just follow up on that because it's a really interesting point. And I, you know, asking you the now in your capacity as an American politics expert and a political scientist, because you know one of the big uh, claims about American politics is this process of um, ideological polarization and effective uh, uh, polarization. That, it, that it's not just that people, you know, on the left and right are increasingly disagreeing on a whole range of issues. And so where you stand determines your position kind of across the board. So it's a ideological package, but we're also seeing this kind of effective, uh, they're also seeing this development of hostility uh, toward those on the other side, right? And, and, you know, and even support for political violence. Uh, against those on the other side is in that respect you know looking at that 
in, as this kind of the big process, the big trends that are occurring in the United States and American politics. Do you think, Eitan, that what's happening on the Israel issue and on, on Israel Palestine is really driven by that broader kind of ideological and political dynamic? In other words, we're seeing this kind of polarization, people sorting into these two broad camps, and along with that, increasing hostility, which may in fact become manifested as anti-Semitism then uh, against Jews, because if you're in the other camp, you know, you are not just somebody we disagree with, but you're kind of our political enemy. Yes, I, I could see that. And I, I think, um, um, especially if, it, you know, as we know, Jews kind of get it from both ends of the spectrum, but to the extent that this has turned into a racialized debate, which which it is. I mean, I had a student on October 9th or something tell me that this, that the October 7th attack was essentially people of color rising up against their white oppressor. And if that's the narrative, it's highly, it's essentially, you know, taking a, a American race narrative that doesn't really make any sense when applied to Israel, but applying it to Israel. And I think that leads to that kind of polarization that's correlated with race and that becomes, um, a big problem, and where I say the Jewish gets fired for both ends. Of course, we know that Jews are also under threat and have been attacked violently from uh, right-wing groups and right-wing individuals that believe that also that Jews are it is a race battle, except that the Jews are are are, are non-white and in that environment. Um, I, I will say that the one interesting, like if if I may, I just think one interesting development with that is essentially like the shifts of coalitions because. Coalitions are not stable and people move all the time. And Trump was a great example of how some people moved from one party to the other or in both directions because of that. And I think you see this um, maybe happening in the Jewish community. A lot of people ha are re questioning their allies. Uh, I think, you, you know, you, you just saw something that was quite profound last week where there was a Republican presidential debate where for 45 minutes, five candidates talked about Israel and anti-Semitism on campus. They, they centered this discussion in, my, in a way that like, I, I think wasn't evidently talking to say like Christians. So for example, if I, you watched the first 45 minutes of the Republican debate from last week, it was something that like um, any one of those people could say exactly that in my synagogue and it would come across very well. <laughs> uh, um, that's a real interesting, shift and i think the campuses are also making a big move here in their own way which is that um higher education is a marketplace like any other and schools develop their brands and um they do that on purpose and they do it by um, Im implicitly and some schools are saying we are a place where we want a certain brand of social justice activism to thrive and there's another group universities are saying we want to make this a place where Jewish students can thrive or where there's ideological diversity or where there isn't ideological diversity. And of course, like it can be hard for students or faculty at any one of those institutions. But I do think we're seeing a kind of sorting happening that you could call polarization, but actually has a great benefit, particularly when it's at the higher education. There's not two parties. There's like a thousand universities where there's brand formation happening that I think can be um, quite exciting, actually. So in that say, some universities will be known as safe places for Jews to study and others uh, may not be, and there'll be a kind of sorting. Um, Matt, you know, Eitan's raised the, the question which I wanted us to turn to about the, the persistence of these attitudes over time, right? Are, are these, how much fluidity do you see versus uh, kind of persistence and we're talking about young people um you know do you think that their attitudes uh, of young american jews are likely to persist over time and or will they will they change as jews get older will they kind of uh become more like older generations i mean you've already said that you don't think there's as much of a of a great difference um but but how how sticky uh, or, or versus fluid do you see these uh, attitudes? Well, so some of it is you know, and, and this is really why I'm harping on how persistent these attitudes have been over time in the Jewish community, and how uh, you know, the the differences between older and younger uh, 
you know, are perhaps not as great as the numbers would make them appear. We have 50 years of data showing that, you know, the young adults of of last generation who are now today's older adults have become more pro-Israel, more Zionist, more attached to Israel over time for all kinds of reasons. Uh, and, uh, you know, and, and there's there are lots of reasons to think that that will happen with the present generation as well. And, you know, as, as they get older, as they leave their college campuses, as they seek more stability and perhaps a little bit less uh, radical politics to the extent that any of this appropriately or inappropriately is described as radical. Uh, you know, they, they might want more stability. They start having kids. They want to get those kids some sort of Jewish education, which entails greater uh, exposure to the organized Jewish community. Like All of these things have an impact. At the same time, when I speak with Jewish baby boomers, there's a clear tendency to embrace Israel as a matter of the survival and continuity of the Jewish people, uh, it's sort of a part of a larger trend that's related to Jewish identity. And it makes perfect sense for a generation that was raised in the shadow of the Holocaust. For millennials and Gen Z, survival and continuity are a given even now, uh, you know, even after the events of October 7th. They're not questioning whether we're going to survive. Maybe Israel, uh, but uh, but they're not questioning: Will I survive? Will my people survive? They just assume it's a given. They're looking for more of a value proposition, and it's harder for them to square support for and connection to Israel with legitimizing Kahanists and bringing them into the coalition, as Prime Minister Netanyahu has done, and treating Palestinians at best like a permanent underclass. They're also less trusting of institutions, both in general and within the Jewish community, often for very good reason. And roughly 70 to 80 percent of them have had some experience in a Jewish educational system, uh, you know, whether it's a day school, Hebrew school, summer camp, youth group, something that has given them, uh, in most cases, a sort of fairy tale version of Israel. They're accustomed to Jewish communal infrastructure that often gives them grief when they ask uncomfortable questions about Israel. And so the end result is often a sort of parallel Jewish communal infrastructure, uh, you know, separate from and distinct from what we think of as the legacy Jewish organizations that is more open to heterodox views. And it's important to note that Israel is only one of several key issues where this is happening. It just might be the one that gets the most attention, but you have to wonder going forward, you know, as the great sociologist Yogi Berra said it's hard to make accurate predictions about the future. Uh, you know, it, it's it's hard to know what's going to happen, but the more entrenched this parallel Jewish communal infrastructure becomes, the more likely it is that the establishments, the you know, the Jewish federations, our synagogues, our Jewish day schools, our summer camps, all of these sorts of organizations that you think of when you think of what does the Jewish community look like they may start becoming irrelevant. Uh, and if that happens, the views that they champion, uh, which tend to be more pro-Israel, more pro-Zionist, less tolerant of dissent, uh, you know, they, they may start disappearing as well. Fascinating. I, so I, um, can you just say something, Matt, about the question of uh, Zionism specifically? You know, one of the claims uh, that's often made on college campuses is that Zionism is a kind of constitutive element of the Jewish identity of uh, Jewish students and therefore should be protected in the way that other um, elements of a person's identity deserve to be protected. Um, you know, you, you, are, you seem to kind of suggest that while young American Jews are attached to Israel, that doesn't necessarily mean support that they identify as Zionists. Um, is that am I drawing the right in inference there? Or? I would say you're certainly heading in the right direction. Zionist has, for many people, uh, become a label that they might have accepted for themselves, you know, twenty, maybe even ten or five years ago. But uh, but there are some negative connotations to it, some socially ascribed, some having to do with the current policies of the current government of the state of Israel that are deeply uncomfortable 
for a lot of Jews who want to support Israel. Uh, I, I think as an example of this, uh, so I've, I've been working on a project for the last roughly year and a half. Uh, I've been arguing for, for many years that I don't think the questions we ask on our surveys are necessarily understood consistently across the entire population in quite the same way. So when we ask, how connected are you to Israel? Well, you know, what, what does connected mean? What does Israel mean? Is Israel the land, the government, the people, the culture, the religious aspects? You know, what, what exactly are we talking about? And the level of connection might vary depending on which one or if we're talking about the totality. Similarly, what does it mean to be a Zionist? If being a Zionist means supporting the existence of a state for the Jewish people in the land of our heritage, uh, that's one thing, but if being a Zionist also means supporting without question all of the policies of the government of the state of Israel, that's another thing altogether. And I think for many of the non-Jewish critics of Zionism, and increasingly for Jewish critics of Zionism, that is what being a Zionist has come to mean. Uh, and so just as an example of what I'm talking about, uh, so this project that I've been working on is a cognitive test of four commonly asked survey questions about Israel uh, that have been asked of Jewish audiences. Uh, a cognitive test, for those who aren't familiar with it, is a tool that social scientists use to assess how is it that the people who take our surveys are interpreting the questions so that we can better understand exactly what it is they mean when they select one of you know, some number of multiple choice responses which is how most surveys work. One of the questions that I tested was, to what extent do you agree or disagree with the following statement, Israel is an apartheid state? Now, I didn't ask the question to endorse or you know, uh, toss away the statement. It's just, what do people think about this? What do people think this question even means when we ask it on a survey? Uh, and two of my very early respondents, I remember distinctly because I was monitoring the individual responses as they came in. Uh, this was before I was sure I had enough to do something analytically with the data. Uh, but two of my very early responses came in within a couple of days of each other. One of them strongly disagreed with the statement. The other strongly agreed. And so, you know, having asked them the survey question, the very next question for them open-ended, write whatever you're thinking about, why did you answer the way that you did? And both of them wrote the exact same thing. They both wrote, it's obvious, no explanation is necessary. But if it's so obvious, why did one of them strongly agree that Israel is an apartheid state and the other strongly disagreed? And so I look at the next question in my cognitive test, which is basically asking them to tell me what they think apartheid means. And here we see the distinction. Uh, you know, and it doesn't really matter for the purposes of this discussion exactly what these two respondents said. One of them was appealing to the 2002 Rome Statute and the UN Convention on the Crime and Suppression of the Crime of Apartheid. I might be mangling the title a little bit. Uh, and the other was uh, was just like, I, I don't like the way Israel treats Palestinians, and so this is apartheid. But if you look at the totality of the uh, roughly 500 pages of transcripts that I have from, uh, you know, from people telling me what they think about this, uh, it was clear that there were many different ways of defining apartheid. And I had uh, something like 130 respondents who identified as Zionists who thought that Israel was an apartheid state. And I could split them into five not equally sized groups. Uh, for some of them, it was just, I don't like Israeli policy, it treats Palestinians differently, that's apartheid, which is, you know, doesn't matter that that's not actually the appropriate definition of apartheid. Uh, it's problematic, I'll grant you that, but that itself does not make it apartheid. Uh, at the other end of the extreme, I had a small number of people who said, yes, of course, Israel is an apartheid state, and that's good. We want more apartheid. We want to oppress the Palestinians. I had Kahanists in my data set. They exist. They're out there. Even in North America, well, well, they Kahana are out there. Came from, uh, came from uh, North America. So, um, Absolutely. And we should acknowledge you know, it. 
Absolutely. And it, but in terms of, I mean, this is one of the problems, obviously, with uh, relying solely on survey data is that we don't necessarily understand how respondents understand yeah. the meaning of these questions and when they what they what they have in mind when they say yes or no to certain kinds of certain kinds of questions. Um, Aitan, we only have a few minutes left. And I, I wanted to, we have a question um, which is coming from our audience um, about the, pol you know, um, this is both asking you in terms of the surveys that you've done, but also in your role as, a, as an expert in American politics and voting. Um, do you, you know, we, we, we obviously have a presidential election coming up next year, a very big, with, you know, massive stakes, to put it mildly. Do you see any of what is, do you think in terms of both Jews and non-Jews, how do you see what we've been talking about here, the attitudes toward, toward Israel, toward anti-Semitism, the, the perception um, that many Jews now have that parts of the left, parts of some progressives, not all, as you've said, but some within the kind of progressive camp are so opposed to Israel that it's actually, can actually lead to support for anti-Semitic things that are in effect anti-Semitic, even if they aren't motivated. Do you think this is going to, what do you think this is going to have an impact on, on uh, the election, on voting behavior? Are we beginning, is there going to be, you know, that much hoped for for many decades, that exodus, Jewish exodus from the Democratic Party toward the Republicans? You know, the Republicans focusing so much now on the issue of campus anti-Semitism, for example, um, yeah. where is the Democrat you know, the progressive constituency is clearly, you know, divided um, at best on these issues. How do you see this playing out politically and over the next, uh, you know, uh, year? Sure. So over the next year, I think it's somewhat straightforward, actually. Uh, if the candidates are Trump and Biden, I actually think there's going to be more Jewish push to the Biden side than to the Trump side, in part because Biden has been had views that I think are very consistent with what the Jewish community wanted. Trump has said some pretty weird stuff. I, I have personal uh, family and friends who voted for Trump, uh, who are in the observant Jewish world, who are planning on voting for Biden on account of that. If the candidates are different, if it's a Nikki Haley, we're in a different we're in a different world. I think that increasingly there are a number of Democratic Jews who thought of someone like Marjorie Taylor Greene as a very serious threat, and someone like. Ayanna Presley or uh, AOC as a uh, a minor thorn in their side, and I think they, there's probably a lot of people who now increasingly see the far left as a threat that's uh, that's that's as serious or more serious than the right. I think there's just to tie. I know we only have a minute, but to tie to Matt's comments, I, I um, one of the the most important uh, anecdotes in my head about understanding this issue comes from Abraham Foxman who is the former head, very controversial head of the Anti-Defamation League from, I think it was like the first Pew study, 2012, it comes out. And the, the headline of an article was, American Jews are way to the left, essentially, of the Jewish establishment when it comes to Israel. And Foxman has this very, gr a great quote as a political scientist, it's a great quote, which is that, oh, I don't represent Jews, I represent Jews who care. And I, when I read that, I was in, I, met, I think I was in grad school, I thought that was an offensive kind of comment to make. And so I go and download the data set and I define care as any way you want. Someone who is even remotely involved in Judaism in any way. And Abraham Foxman is absolutely right. The Jewish establishment, no matter how you define who cares, engaged, donates, spends time with their kids in Jewish ways. That community is tied to Israel and um, will tolerate the problems of Israel's democracy in a way that is just a totally different world from Jews who don't care. And so um, the Jews who care, and I, again, I, I, I mean that in, 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 the, in the most liberal sense, any way you mean care, have a different relationship to politics and to this conflict than anyone else. And they will be increasingly sensitive to the far left's opposition to Israel. And they'll be increasingly demanding that Jewish institutions don't match what the median Jewish voter is, as Abraham Foxman said, we shouldn't care about that. We, he, from his perspective, from the Jewish establishment, they're there to represent the Jews who care. And I think that's an interesting thing to think about, an interesting frame to think about, and maybe to close with, because uh, um, 
families and scholars and experts of all kinds are thinking about what what caring means at this moment and how that should relate to their practices and, and, and attitudes. Absolutely. I think one of the big takeaways from this whole uh, fascinating conversation has been, you know, the need to disaggregate these big groups. We often talk in, in these broad generalities of, you know, young Jews versus older Jews or young progressives or progressives versus, you know, conservatives. And actually, we've, you know, both of you have really, uh, I think, done a fantastic job of bringing in some of the variation within these broad categories that we, that, that we use and that we have to be a little bit more careful uh, rather than making these sweeping generalizations that young people think this and young Jews say that, or, you know, uh, progressives are X, um, to, to be more attentive to the divisions and the variations within these uh, broad groups. And um, I want to thank you both for, for you know, um, doing a fantastic job, particularly bringing in the empirical research that you've both been doing, because it's so important uh, to actually uh, try and answer these questions based upon actual hard uh, data and not on just on personal anecdotes. Um, so thank you both. Um, I want to remind all our audience, I want to first of all thank our audience members for joining us and a reminder that this will be, uh, the recording of this will be posted on the Nazarian Center's website, uh, as well as on our YouTube channel. Um, you can also um, reach out to us. We will, uh, I know people have been asking for uh, your research, uh, Professor Boxer and Professor Hirsch, so, um, you know, I think you have a website where, where they might be able to, to get some of that. So, um, you know, you can find their research online. I strongly encourage you uh, to look for that um, and to share it because it really does give that, you know, um, empirically backed uh, findings as opposed to the kinds of hot-headed speculation that uh, often passes for analysis in the media these days. So thank you both again. And thank you all for joining us today and see you next time.